Good morning. Uh, this committee of the Health and Human Services uh, will begin. Good morning, all. Um, we have a number of bills on the agenda today. We will start with Senate file. Oh, I will note that we have a quorum, and Senator Liskey is joining uh, via Zoom. We will start with Senate file 4570. Uh, Senator Wickland, to your bill. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And today we are taking up Senate file 4570, which is with the, um, the A6 amendment will be our uh, vehicle for the um, Senate um, health licensing um, scope of practice um, omnibus bill. And this bill um, has um, incorporates a great deal of work that we've done over the past few weeks in this committee. Um, these are all uh, bills that uh, we have heard in the committee. There's nothing um, added to the, the bill that wasn't something that we talked about or heard in the committee. Um, you have in your packet a very uh, detailed bill summary uh, from Senate Council, and that goes through um, kind of section by section. Um, but I thought it would be helpful for all of us just to have the same um, understanding of kind of what is in um, each article, not down to the section level, but an article level. And I asked um, if Mr. Hodala could give us a an overview of the bill in that way so that we all kind of know what, what bills are included. So if you could do that, that would be great. Very good. Mr. Hudell? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I would be happy to walk through the index to the A6 Delete Everything Amendment, which, as Senator Wickland uh, alluded to, incorporates 15 different bills, each of which has already been heard by this committee. Given that, I won't spend too much time discussing the specific provisions of the various bills, but rather we'll focus a bit more attention on where the bill language has been revised uh, since it was last heard in HHS. Uh, another preliminary note is that two bills do in fact have components that cross multiple articles in this amendment. Specifically, Senate File 3523 on behavior analysts is entirely in Article 2, except for its appropriation section, which is the only section in Article 13, which is appropriately the appropriation section. And then three words of Senate File 1743 on certified midwives are included in Article 8, which is the Board of Pharmacy article. So with that, I'll move on to describing Article 1 of the bill. Um, as amended, which is entirely composed of Senator Aki's Senate File 2611, which establishes a new category of registration for a transfer care specialist. These registrants may move a dead body if they're supervised by a licensed mortician. The bill language has not been changed since this committee amended it. Article 2 starts on page 12 of the A6 Delete Everything Amendment and only contains Senator Kupek's Senate File 3523. The article establishes a new category of licensure for behavior analysts and assistants and accordingly creates a new scope of practice for the practice of applied behavior analysis. 3523 was amended in the Judiciary Committee um, and the goal of that amendment was to make the bill's background check provisions more consistent with other similar Minnesota laws. Article 3, titled Board of Veterinary Medicine, contains two different bills, both chief authored by Senator Kupek. Senate File 1522 establishes licensure for vet techs, and Senate File 1773 creates a license type called an institutional license. This new license type can be issued to a person who is ineligible for a regular vet license, but who seeks to practice while employed by the University of Minnesota. Neither bill has been modified since being laid over by this committee. Similar to Article 3, Article 4 also contains two bills with unchanged language. This article begins on page 30 of the amendment, and it relates to dental practitioners. Specifically, Senator Kupek, Senate File 1234, makes a single word change, replacing an and with an or, which modifies the required education and criteria for dental assistance. And Senator Bolden, Senate File 3500, removes a provision of existing law prohibiting a specialty dentist who holds a general dental license from practicing in another area of dentistry 
if the dentist has announced a limitation of practice to only the specialty area. Article 5 is entirely composed of Senator Hoffman's Senate File 4124, which repeals a requirement that a PA must act in collaboration with the physician to provide ongoing psychiatric treatment for either one, children with emotional disturbances, or two, adults with serious mental illnesses. This bill has not been changed since being previously heard here. Article 6 contains a Senator Hoffman bill which has been revised since its HHS hearing. That bill, Senate File 3691, affects provisional social workers, and it was amended in the state and local government committee. That amendment deleted sections 3 and 4 of the bill. Both of those sections related to the number of hours of supervised practice in which a provisional licensee must engage. The same state and local government amendment also added sections that specifically describe pathways for licensure as a social worker through completion of the provisional license requirements um, outlined in this bill. For reference, those new sections can be found in Article 6, Section 7 to 10 of the amendment, which starts on page 37. Moving on to Article 7 brings us to Senator Wicklund's Senate File 4570, which is the vehicle bill for this DE amendment. Uh, and that uh, Senate File 4570 provides for guest licensure of marriage and family therapists. This new license would be for non-Minnesota residents that intend to practice marriage and family therapy in the state, but who are not seeking a full license. A single purely technical amendment was made to this bill in the state and local government committee. Article 8, starting on page 41, includes sections 2 to 4 of the Delete Everything Amendment that this committee adopted to Senator Dibble's 2320. Those three sections included here authorize a pharmacist to prescribe and administer drugs to prevent the acquisition of HIV if certain requirements are met. In addition, as previously noted, this Article 8 contains three words from Senate File 1743. Specifically, it adds licensed certified midwives to the Pharmacy Practice Act's definition of practitioner. Article 9 only includes Senator McQuaid's Senate File 659, which revises the scope of practice for optometrists. This bill is unchanged from its HHS, HHS hearing except for one modification that was not made by a Senate committee. That modification is found on line 46.18. The original version of this bill proposed to permit optometrists to administer legend drug, drugs uh, intravenously, intramuscularly, or by injection, but prohibit them from administering intravitreal injections. The language of the amendment currently in front of the committee would revert this proposal such that the existing statutory language on injections would remain in place. Article 10 at page 47 has two bills relating to licensure within the Board of Medical Practices oversight. Senator Hoffman's Senate File 2342 revises the scope of practice of acupuncture and herbal medicine and Senator Mann's uh, Senate File 3611 creates a limited license to practice medicine for international medical graduates. Senator Hoffman's bill has not been modified, but Senator Mann's bill was amended by the state and local government committee solely to insert effective dates. Article 11 is solely Senate File 1743, which is Senator Bolden's bill establishing licensure for certified midwives by the Board of Nursing. In Article 12 is Senator Boland, Senate File 2982, which licenses speech language pathology assistance. The Judiciary Committee adopted an amendment to each of these two bills. However, please note that those two amendments are not included in this A6 DE amendment, but rather are included in this morning's A14 amendment. And then the final article is Article 13, which is the appropriations article. It only contains one section, which, as previously noted, comes from Senate File 3523. This appropriation would be in fiscal year 2025, and it's from the state government special revenue fund to the Board of Psychology to implement the provisions of that bill. Thank you, and I am, of course, happy to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you very much. Senator Wickland? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I hope that that was helpful. Um, one 
comment I would make is that uh, when we were looking at uh, which bills were possible to include, um, we aren't able to include uh, bills that carry um, general fund costs. And so uh, we did hear and have discussion about, um, for example, the Senate file 1176, which was the other pharmacy related bill. Um, and so that is something that, you know, we're, we're still discussing and talking about the language, but it, um, it had some general fund impact. And so we, we didn't feel we could carry that in this bill. This bill will have um, special revenue fund um, costs, but not um, general fund impact. Um, and then I, I guess I wondered if members um, have more any questions about the A6. Um, we do have a number of technical amendments or amendments to the A6, so I wondered if, you know, if we could adopt the A6, then we can go forward with those other amendments, but I don't want to limit any conversation or questions about the A6. Members, questions about the A6 before we adopt it, so that will be the, the bill that we are working from. Senator Abler. Yeah, thank you, and uh, well, I appreciate that we're getting this big body of work done. Um, on the optometrist, it seems like that's a pretty skinny version, and so it's probably better than nothing. Um, would it be safe to say the ophthalmologists uh, are comfortable with that language? Um, Senator Wickland. I, I think I, I can't really speak for, um, you know, the professions, either one. Um, I think from my perspective, we had uh, work going on. Senator May Quaid was working diligently with both groups. Senator Mann um, worked with um, work with both groups to try to come to agreement on additional, more specific language. And um, from my perspective, the, the, the language that related to um, pharmaceuticals was more um, well, uh, had reached more of a consensus. Um, but I think my view is also that the, the language around surgery and injections um, well, both um, Senator May Quaid had presented additional language and Senator Mann, um, they were not um, able to come to what I would consider a greater consensus on that language. And I think it needs to have more discussion. This isn't to say that the discussion ends here today or ends after our session this year, but um, it just didn't feel to me that, that that language had reached that point. Well, thanks. Senator Abler. And thanks, yeah, Madam Chair. It just seems like a thoughtful middle ground, and so it's nice. Something can go forward. It's been really controversial for a long, for the time I've been mm -hmm. here, counting votes and all that. So anyway, thank you. Yep. Other questions or comments about the A6? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll move adoption of the A6. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries, and the amendment is adopted. Yeah. Uh, we will move. Uh, Senator Wickland, any other comments before we move to testimony? Uh, no, not, not right now. All right. First, we will hear from Dr. Lauren Haverly, and after that will be Sue Abderholden. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Lauren Haverly, immediate past president of the Minnesota Optometric Association. We appreciate the work done this session by Chair Wicklin, the members of the committee, and the staff as the optometry scope language progresses. We know many of you here have spent countless hours and late nights on this topic, so we are sincerely, sincerely grateful. Article 9, Section 1 of the A6 Amendment is a long overdue fix for quality eye care in Minnesota, and our patients will be better served when this becomes law. With the updated medication language, Minnesota optometrists will join 48 other states in prescribing oral antivirals without restrictions, 44 other states prescribing oral and anhyd or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors without restrictions, as well as 44 other states prescribing oral steroids to patients. These medications are crucial in treating ocular disease, safeguarding vision, and improving quality of life. Still, Minnesota has a long way to go 
and we remain hopeful that our scope will be further aligned with our education and training, specifically as it relates to injections. Since I testified in this committee six weeks ago, two additional states have actually updated their scope of practice to allow optometrist injection authority, uh, putting the number of states at 26 or over half the country. Minnesota optometrists remain committed to the health and well-being of our patients and urge the committee to revisit injections next session to benefit both patients and the entire healthcare system. In 2023, the Journal of Ophthalmology published an article titled Ophthalmology Workforce Projections in 2020 to 2035, and it detailed that the current ophthalmology workforce is already insufficient to meet service demands. That shortfall is projected to worsen by 2035. Patients will suffer. Please do not wait until there is a worse shortfall to allow capable optometrists to provide the health care that we are educated and trained to provide. Please consider facts over fear. The time to act is now. Already after nearly a decade of discussions, optometry has demonstrated considerable flexibility and willingness to compromise on many fronts. We compromised extensively to get this language today, but a decade of discussions see us arriving in the bottom 15% of our country in basic scope of optometrists, and Minnesota becoming an island of scope amongst our neighbors. Make no mistake, the A6 amendment is a step in the right direction. And we also look forward to further discussions to enhance patient outcomes in our state. Thank you all for your support and including the A6 amendment in SF 4570. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Abler. Do you mind if I ask a question? Oh, no. the um, well, thanks for coming. Uh, you heard my question before. And we've been, what was it, 03, the first time we started doing some of this stuff? Who can put salve somewhere or whatever? Um, and so, can I just, were the, I've not been part of any discussions, I'm not, I don't know if I'm an author on the bill or not, but um, I support the direction you're going in, and we talked about that at the last hearing, and I appreciate that there's some, something going forward, so I'm not really criticizing the content of the bill, but um, this seems in the past there's been a bigger brother, smaller brother kind of a thing here where the ophthalmologists have been like, well, we don't really have to compromise at all because we don't have to. Um, has that, but then talking behind the scenes of, at the, with some of the clinicians from the U, they seemed like they were actually kind of interested in chatting. Has the tone improved uh, from the past with your dialogue, with injections and the various elements you're talking about, do you think? Uh, Dr. Haverly. Madam Chair. The... Uh, the portion of our bill that uh, would allow, or that already 48 other states allow, ophthalmology would not even completely agree to that. They still uh, agreed to part of it, but not completely. So that would have kept Minnesota as one of two states in the country to not be able to fully prescribe oral, uh, oral antivirals. Yeah. Senator Abler. I don't want to relitigate it, but I just hope that those discussions can go forward in good faith. And, I, and just I want to remind all the parties that on any of these negotiations, good faith doesn't mean you sit in a meeting and then don't do anything because um, you don't have to because you think you have the votes or whatever. But I think what's with the state of the workforce and healthcare now, we need everybody to be able to do what they reasonably can do to serve the people, particularly in a time when there's not enough uh, provider people to go around. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next testifier is Sue Abderholden, and then we will hear from Dr. Siri Feibiger. Ms. Abderholden, please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair Members. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota National Alliance on Mental Illness. You know, typically licensing, omnibus licensing bills are not controversial. People are told to work it out to achieve consensus, except this year. The changes to the physician assistance section of the law is strongly opposed by the two organizations that represent children and adults with mental illnesses and their families, and by the organizations representing mental health professionals. So the organizations that hear from and are made up of the very people who will be impacted, and the organizations that know the training and experience that is required to diagnose and treat serious mental illnesses are all opposed to this bill. 
It truly boggles my mind that the legislature is allowing this to pass without requiring consensus. One class and one rotation in psychiatry does not qualify you to diagnose and treat people with serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, and other diagnoses that involve psychosis. Schizophrenia is one of the most disabling conditions in the world. PAs are simply not qualified to diagnose or develop a treatment plan for this serious illness or others. APRNs, psychologists, clinical social workers, all have way more classes and hours of supervision in psychiatry and mental health. They are mental health professionals. PAs are not. Their scope of practice should be limited. Some have said to me, well, don't worry, they probably know they shouldn't diagnose and treat those serious mental illnesses, but if the comments on social media and here at the legislature are to be taken seriously, they think they can. We are okay with them diagnosing anxiety and depression, especially in a primary care office. Um, we're okay with them continuing treatment plans for people who are stable. The previous compromise language, the language in current law that you are repealing, was supposed to limit the PAs so they wouldn't be diagnosing and treating very serious mental illnesses. You know, the delegation agreement that's online for PAs doesn't even list antipsychotics as a checkoff for medications. If the law needs to be clarified, then let's do so. We've suggested defining what a serious mental illness is, which would include schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, eating disorders, major depressive disorder with psychotic features, and other psychotic disorders. We've suggested allowing them to diagnose children or adults with serious mental illnesses if they took the additional one-year training and national test that is actually recommended by the National PA organization. To be honest, no one needs to tell me that we have a workforce crisis. I take those calls and emails every single day. But we are doing a disservice to children and adults struggling with some of the most debilitating and complex illnesses to allow PAs to do this work. I urge you to take a minute and just really think about this. And if you would take your child or loved one to a PA who is hearing voices, who is struggling with an eating disorder, please delete Article 5 from your bill and push to have a compromise on this issue. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, uh, we will move to uh, testimony via Zoom with Dr. Suri Feibiger. Please uh, unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Dr. Suri Feibiger, representing the Minnesota section of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And I too wanna thank you for your extensive work this session and including our single most uh, important priority this session, which is Senate File 1743, as it will help address the critical maternal health needs by creating this more affordable and therefore more accessible avenue for midwifery lic licensure. Expanding patient access to high quality midwifery care is both cost effective and beneficial to maternal health with lower cesarean and preterm delivery rates and higher birth rates and higher breastfeeding rates. Other states that have expanded midwifery access have better maternal and newborn outcomes. Increasing culturally competent and integrated midwifery care is a critical part of ACOG's collaborative work with family medicine and with midwifery to have the right provider in the right place at the right time across the state of Minnesota. And I'm more than happy to address any, any questions. Thank you for your testimony. And last, we will hear from Mandy Huber. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, I'm Mandy Huber, nurse midwife. I am the legislative chair of the American College of Nurse Midwives. Uh, I would like to thank Chair Wickland for hearing this bill, this session, and for Senator Bolden for her authorship and advocacy since the very beginning. The American College of Nurse Midwives has um, housed certified midwives as well as certified nurse midwives for over 30 years in this country with very successful outcomes. States that um, license certified midwives experience an expanded diverse membership of their midwifery students and then midwifery licensees. This is greatly needed in Minnesota where less than 8% of our practicing midwives identify as indigenous or midwives of color. Dr. Fiebiger so beautifully explained why midwifery is successful. And I'd like to remind the members of the committee that at this point in Minnesota, 
we have a evidence-based solution to improve maternity outcomes in the state, and we're actually more at risk by not licensing certified midwives. I'm available for any questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, and one more testifier, uh, Tom Lehman. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed when you are ready. Madam Chair and members, my name is Tom Lehman. <clears throat> I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Academy of Physician Assistants. I didn't plan on testifying today, as you have a letter in your packet from the Academy, uh, but some statements earlier prompt me to bring some accuracy to the discussion. The Academy thanks Chair Wickland for Article 5 of the DE Amendment, which includes the provisions of Senator Hoffman's bill to expand access to mental health services. As you heard during testimony on Senator Hoffman's bill and continue to hear from mental health advocates, from law enforcement agencies, from hospitals, from clinics, from schools and families, we are experiencing a severe shortage of clinicians who can diagnose mental illness and prescribe and monitor medications that can help patients. You've heard statements that the mental health system is in crisis because of this shortage. These statements are correct. We need more mental health providers of all types and of all licenses to help meet the growing demand for care. That is why restricting PAs from practicing at the top of their license is bad for patients. The Board of Medical Practice and hospitals desperate for mental health clinicians support this provision because they know the concerns raised by its opponents are without merit. Despite, despite statements to the contrary that ignore facts, PAs are trained to diagnose and treat mental illness. PAs are licensed to diagnose and treat mental illness. PAs have been diagnosing and treating mental illness in Minnesota for decades, and they're doing it today. The Board of Medical Practice knows this because they are the state regulatory board that issues PAs their licenses to practice medicine. As you've heard, some disagree because they believe PAs need more education and training. But believing PAs need more education doesn't mean they do. The Board of Medical Practice doesn't believe this. Fairview doesn't believe this. CMS, the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, doesn't believe this. The 21st Century Cures Act doesn't believe this. Mental Health Legislative Network, which represents a broad coalition of mental health advocates and providers, doesn't believe this. 49 states, 49 other states don't believe this. I may believe I'll be the starting goalie this fall for Senator Kupik's Hartford Whalers. Does that mean I need to get my skates sharpened? Probably not. But I'm entitled to that belief, just as people who are opposed to this provision are entitled to their beliefs. Madam Chair, budget realities mean that you don't have a budget target this year that will allow you to make additional investments in our health care system, including mental health. But Article 5 of your bill will make a meaningful difference for patients who are waiting to get mental health care that they need in hospitals where those patients are now being warehoused in emergency departments. Thank you, Madam Chair, for including this important provision in your bill. Thank you, members. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Senator Wickland, any other comments before we move to amendments? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I would just want to acknowledge that I think that um, you know, there are points of contention in the bill, and we still need to, you know, continue hearing from folks on um, ways that maybe, maybe it's possible to address. Um, I think that it's hard to get to a point where everyone is in alignment and, and in agreeing, but um, I do want to acknowledge that, that I'm hearing, um, I hear what people are saying, and I do... Um, hopefully, if you have members on the committee have other information and other ideas, I'm um, hopeful that we can continue discussions. Thank you. Uh, we will move to amendments. Um, Senator mm -hmm. Wicklin, would you like to move uh, your amendments first? Sure. I'd like to move the A14 amendment, which is one that's in your packet. And this amendment, um, as Senate Council referenced earlier, is um, relates to two different um, provisions in the bill. One relates to the certified midwife provisions, and um, 
line 1.7 relates to the speech language pathology assistant language, and these were um, identified in judiciary and you know were discussed in that um, setting. So just want to make these changes to update the bill. Questions about the A14 members? All right, seeing none, um, all those in favor of the A14 say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries and the A14 is adopted. Senator Wickland. Um, yeah, the only other one that I have um, is the A10 and that relates to the the bill that, that I carried that's a, the uh, the base bill for this um, omnibus it's the guest license uh, provision and this would um, add effective dates in that section so add, or a couple sections in that article questions about the a10 amendment members seeing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. all those opposed say nay motion carries and the a10 is adopted other amendments, members? Senator Kupek. Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to offer the A15 amendment. The A15 amendment was passed out by the pages, so members should have that. Senator Kupek. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. The A15 amendment is a technical amendment to the vet tech uh, licensure uh, changes the uh, effective date last year we tried to pass this and it did not pass um, and the bill still had last the effective date from last year so it uh, pushes that back um, and it also uh, is to add a temporary alternative uh, after additional on line 2619 um, this is a request from the Board of Veterinary Medicine so it's mostly just a technical amendment questions or comments on the a15 members Senator Wickland, um, it, I think it's you know something that we need to to do, and it seems like a technical amendment. So, all right, all those in favor of the A15 say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries, and the A15 is adopted. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. At the request of the acupuncturist, I will offer the A12. Thus, it's Senator Hoffman's amendment, but he's still on the way in. And I can describe it after you uh, announce it. Uh, well, the A12 is before us. Um, Senator Abler moves the A12. Senator Abler. You know, it's uh, Senator Wickland, I, I really appreciate you taking on this bill with all the interfaces. And I think uh, the audience is well aware uh, whenever there's an interface in any two professions that there's friction. We think the ophthalmolo ophthalmologist optometry one is a classic case in point, which has been riding along for more than 20 years. Um, this relates to uh, acupuncturists and nutritional counseling and dietary counseling and parsing that. And, um, and, and so uh, out of consideration for the compromise reached between the nutritionists or dietitians or whatever uh, and the acupuncturists, I'm offering this. But I would just like to opine. I would have voted against this if I wasn't offering it. <laughs> um, but it's, but, I, but it's, it's in the spirit of honorable compromise as we move these bills forward to get something accomplished in a really good way um, that we have to appreciate the sensitivities of, of both sides. Um, uh, in my world, uh, there is a crying need for, for more nutritional counseling. And there are not, frankly, enough dietitians or nutritionists to go around to offer this, uh, especially into the Medicaid population. Um, and I, I think it's kind of technical. And so the, the effect of this, the effect of all these words on paper is what is the board overseeing these individuals going to enforce and make an issue out of? And so um, I'm happy to keep peace in the valley. I think the acupuncturist bill is necessary enough to go forward. Um, but I hope that, um, and I haven't talked to, I don't know what you call them, it's nutritionists or dietitians, whatever they call themselves. And I have a lot of respect for their expertise, and they know a lot. They work in hospitals and help people with salt-free diets and all that. And, um, and, and they're highly trained. Um, but I think as a, one group becomes highly trained, they have to appreciate that other groups that have parallel training um, are able to do a lot of good things. 
and back to, and not to reference this part, but to go back to the optomo ophthalmologist optometry thing, that just when one, one profession gets another thing that they can do that somebody else happens to do as well, it doesn't threaten the profession who had a yield on that point. So anyway, sorry for the lecture, but I, um, I think this will be necessary, and so if Senator Wickland will accept it, I would appreciate that. Senator Wickland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the, the, your presentation of the amendment, and um, yeah, I, I would see it as a friendly amendment. I would support it. Other questions or discussion members? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the A-12 say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries, and the A-12 is adopted. Other amendments, members? Manager. Senator Mann. Um, I have the A-8, maybe. Senator Mann moves the A-8 amendment. Would you like to describe it? Uh, the pages will pass out the A-8. Okay. Um, uh, members, Madam Chair, the A-8 um, is part of the International Medical Graduate Bill. Um, it strikes out language that an international medical graduate has had to uh, gone through a residency program significantly, I think the language is equivalent to one in America, essentially. Um, we had that language in the bill, but then we heard from multiple people from multiple countries that training looks very different in other countries. So if we keep that language in the bill, it'll essentially prevent a lot of really competent people from practicing medicine in Minnesota. Questions, members, about the A8? Senator Abler. So I'm just trying to understand it, and um, I, I'll just ask the author. Um, I, you know, I'm a big fan of this going forward. Does this make it easier for these foreign graduates to, uh, uh, to succeed in getting a, a providing role in Minnesota and elsewhere? Senator Mann. Madam Chair, Senator Ebler. So I, I don't know if it makes it easier, but if we leave the language in there, it will make it impossible for some people to, to practice medicine here. Senator Abler. The difficult takes a while, the impossible takes longer. So, but it's, it's friendly to what you're trying to do. I, and I wouldn't, I know what you're trying to do. I just want to make sure. So thank you for, thank you for the, the, the piece of legislation. Thank you. It's really important. And literally hundreds of docs and this, co this doesn't cover doctors. Is it uh, many credentials or just medical doctors? Madam Chair. Senator Mann. Medical doctors. All right. Yeah. Senator Abler. Sorry, Madam Chair. Senator Mann. But we can work on language to increase that to nurses and other people. I yeah, know that would be good. Yeah. And Madam Senator Chair, this Abler. has been a crying need, and we have literally hundreds of foreign trained docs who have very high credentials. And this is great. So thank you, Senator Mann. Other comments on the A8? Senator Wickland. Um, well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, it seems like uh, we. We want to make the, the bill language workable, and if this is a way to, you know, address a concern about that particular, um, those particular lines, um, this seems like a reasonable approach. So I would support it. All right, members, all those in favor of the A8 say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries, and the A8 is adopted. And I'm going to hand the gavel to Senator Chair Mann. More amendments? <laughs> Senator Bolden. I would offer the A7. Members, A7, do we have that? Okay. Uh, Senator, would you like to explain that amendment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the A7 is uh, in relation to this uh, speech language pathology assistant uh, section of the bill, um, and it just uh, removes one section. This came in uh, collaboration and agreement uh, with the department. Members, questions? Seeing none, Senator Wicklin. Um, this seems like an agreed upon amendment, and I, I would support it. All those in favor of the A7 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Members, further amendments? Senator Bolden. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the A9. Everyone have the A9? Can you please explain the A9? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This is re in relation to the certified midwife section of the bill. It adds licensing fees, um, and this was agreed upon and worked on in collaboration with the Board of Nursing, and it also adds an effective date. Numbers, questions? Seeing none, Senator Wicklin. Uh, seems like important things to add, so I would support it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Further amendments? <coughs> See, Senator Abler. Well, to that last thing, did you fill in the blank on line 60.21, or is that done somewhere else? On your same feed thing? Or was that already fixed? Uh, Mr. Hudla. Hudala. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, that is filled in the blank. If you look at uh, line 1.3 of the amendment, it says page 60, lines 10 and 21. Um, we were able to do that because the fee is exactly Roseanne, the same. Roseanne, Roseanne, Dana. Senator Never Abler. mind. Thanks. Um, comments, questions about the bill as amended? Seeing none, Senator Wicklin. Well, I... Um, I appreciate the attention to the details that we needed to discuss today, and I appreciate uh, members' comments about our work process and how we need to continue to work together with the different stakeholder groups to um, come to consensus or come to agreement on uh, what language we want to put forward. Um, I think that we have done a, a lot of good work um, in the committee hearings and behind the scenes, and I really appreciate all of the work that the authors have put into these bills because um, they do take um, substantial time and a um, substantial number of committee stops for some of them. Um, so I really uh, appreciate that um, we were able to include um, these these items. Uh, would have been, uh, we were thinking we might be able to include some of the compacts, but then um, some of the, the work in judiciary isn't completed, and we need to have that um, happen before we can move forward with those. Um, and uh, I guess from here, I, I would just say that um, this bill will go to the state government committee. Um, it will have to go to rules as a late bill first, but um, in state government, there are a, a couple provisions that need to be reviewed in that committee. Um, and then the bill will move forward to the Finance Committee and we will incorporate the, the information we receive about uh, fiscal impacts that are within the SGSR accounts. So that is the plan for the bill and then we will move it to the floor. So I appreciate members' time today. Motion on the table is for Senate File 4570. Uh, as amended, to be recommended to pass and be referred to state and local government. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The bill is passed. Next up, we have Senator Muhammad, Senate File 4018. Welcome to our committee, Senator Mohammed. And uh, I believe there is an A1 amendment. Is that um, something you'd like to adopt as an author's amendment? Yes, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'll move the amendment. Senator Abler moves the A1. Um, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A1 is adopted. Senator Muhammad, please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Chair Wickland and members of the committee. Good morning. Thank you for having me again. Before you is Senate File 4018. This piece of legislation is so important right now. 
It is what advocates, counties, and people with lived experience have called the Bridge to Shelter Act. This committee's jurisdiction is all about human needs. I believe we can all agree that every human needs a roof over their head when they go home at night. It is hard for people to meet their basic needs if they don't have a shelter. I'm here to tell you that we continue to face a crisis in unsheltered homelessness in Minnesota. It is unacceptable that in 2024, any Minnesotan is living outside, especially in negative 10, 15 degree weather, although we're having a good winter, because they lack a stable and dignified place to call at home, to call home. We are home to America, to a, one of America's coldest counties, International Falls, is perhaps the coldest rural county in the country. These are the places where it is unacceptable for the state of Minnesota to allow anyone to live outside at any time of year, especially in the winter. The crisis looks different across our state, but the outcome is the same. People suffer, families suffer, and children suffer. The Bridge to Shelter Act will advance our collective goal of ensuring that no Minnesotan should experience unsheltered homelessness. A coalition of impacted groups, providers, and counties have endorsed this bill, almost 30, and it's growing. This bill would provide necessary funding to counties, to tribal nations, and to, and to the continuum care, to the continuums of care, and to homelessness providers to fill gaps that exist in current state programs. It would fund exist. It would fund. Uh, it would fund crisis response, outreach diversion, navigation, and housing focused case management. It would also use the point in time or pit. Count, uh, count as the denominator in determining the size of awards. There would be five, award, five awarded regions in the state, including two, greater Minnesota, two in Greater Minnesota. The amendment you have adopted incorporate, incorporates additional feedback from providers, from providers adv and advocates for the tribes and counties to ensure that there is maximum local flexibility in how these funds are distributed and that we, proper, and that we properly in, engage and respect our tribal nations and their role in homelessness response. Areas of the state that have scaled up these services have seen decreased in unhoused populations. This bill invests in, in successful strategies. This bill is also necessary because the new resources we provided to cities and counties last year will not be able to scale up the amount of affordable housing proportionate to the number of Minnesotans who are, who are priced out of a home. Counties have said, it, have said that, it will at least, uh, that it will at least take five years until these units come online. So this, so this bill is the lifeline for them to, to, for them to fill the gap. That's why it's called, it's called, <clears throat> that's why it's called the, bridge to the Bridge to Shelter Act. The financial model for the current system is not sustainable. Homelessness response overwhelmingly relies on local property tax, taxes fund. Counties like mine, Hennepin, Hennepin County, have been forced to increase their financial support because frankly, there aren't just enough, there aren't just any other funds. Local governments are the biggest funders of, homeless, of homelessness response in Minnesota. The state needs to step up with proper state help so we can help in the crisis. And um, I mentioned um, Hennepin County is my county, and I believe we have County Commissioner with us today to speak to the bill. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Thank you. Um, moving to your testifiers, yes, the first uh, one I have on the list is Hennepin County Commissioner Angela Conley. Welcome to our committee, and please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Angela Conley, Hennepin County Commissioner. Madam Chair and Senators, I want to thank you first and foremost for hearing Senate File 4018, Senator Muhammad's bill to address critical funding needs in our state's homelessness response system. Again, my name is Angela Conley and I'm a Hennepin County Commissioner. First and foremost, um, Senator Muhammad, thank you for authoring this really important legislation. And next, I just want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, I believe that every elected official in this state shares our values that not one single child or adult in need deserves to sleep outside. And that everyone deserves safe and dignified roofing over their heads. Hennepin County is backing this bill because we are committed to ensuring that homelessness is rare, brief, and non-recurring. 
We are backing this bill because people in each of our 87 counties all over this state experience homelessness because that is unacceptable to us and to you and because we know that counties want to stand up and do something about that. But to be able to do something about that, we're going to need your help. Homelessness response system looks different across the state, and I want to share just some information about Hennepin. We responded to this crisis of homelessness by deepening our investments in homelessness response. We and our partners innovated um, and funded things like early intervention assistance for people as they enter the system, capital and operating operations funding for low barrier shelters like Avivo Village and AICDC Homeward Bound, 24-7 operations for existing shelters. We really needed to do that. Housing-focused case management to help people in shelter and unsheltered um, settings move to permanent housing and stay there and they've been staying there. Hennepin has a fundamental belief that no child, again, should sleep outside. And we are one of um, the only counties in the nation with a shelter all policy for families. So unfortunately, our family shelter system has seen a four-fold increase in demand since the start of the pandemic. These are families with children. Market forces and policies like the end of the eviction moratorium and unmet needs in behavioral health force more families into homelessness than ever before. We don't want to fail them. Again, we need your help. Overall, Hennepin County spends $191 million per year towards the full continuum of homelessness and housing interventions. This is up from an estimated $146 million just three years ago. Thanks to recent state legislative achievements, we can now budget about $10 million for intervention services like schools to housing, legal help, and housing navigators for, been, or for housing court to prevent people from being evicted in the first place. These are initiatives that will take time to implement and impact our residents. So in the meantime, we need to maintain a robust homeless crisis response system. And Madam Chair and Senators, we need a bridge to shelter. And that's exactly what Senate File 4018 will provide for us. So now I'd love to uh, talk more with you about our success rate in transitioning people from shelter to long-term housing, and I'd love to talk to you about our culturally specific outreach and approach, and of course, to shower you with statistics for people who love uh, numbers, but I think what is most valuable here for you today is to hear from what I like to call the experts, and these are the people who are on the ground providers. And I want you to hear from someone who has lived experience um, of being being unsheltered, a person who advises our own continuum of care so we make the best decisions about how to spend the limited funding that we do have. And while I'm only here on behalf of Hennepin County, I hope that you hear in my voice and in the voices of the other testifiers today on this bill and in the information we share, a story that echoes in all 87 counties across Minnesota. And with that, Madam Chair and Senators, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, next on the list, I have Travis Earth Warner. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and Committee. Thanks for having me. My name is Travis Earth Warner. I'm the Chief Program Officer for American Indian Community Development Corporation. We oversee Homeward Bound uh, Shelter. Uh, the impact that has made to uh, our community has been fairly significant. Uh, American Indians have high disparities and are overrepresented in the homeless system. With Homeward Bound, we have responded and had successful transitions into housing and placements, uh, such as chemical dependency treatments, uh, mental health referrals to APS, um, and the success that we've had wouldn't have been possible without Hennepin County support. Um, we ask you that you know you expand this progress because the impact that I have seen as an outreach worker and on the ground as a frontline worker um, has been pivotal. Um, and, and you know it's just amazing to see the progress that we have made over the last few years. Um, 
it's my first time doing this, so I'm a little nervous, so I apologize. But um, Homeward Bound, I've seen people I went to elementary school with, people I went to middle school with in high school and have hard times. And I've seen them transition into housing and move forward with their life, and they need a helping hand. In my community, we're not taught how to move forward. We, we, we don't have a shot out the gate. Um, you know, because we, we're, we're perpetuated by, by you know, poverty and, 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 and the unknowingness on how to proceed forward. But I am one of those children, and I have progressed forward with tons of support, and I've lended that support to my community and surrounding individuals. So I ask that we move this forward, and I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much for your for your the, sharing the information with us. I appreciate it. Um, next, I have Steve Horsfield. Good morning. Welcome, Hello. and please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you. My name is Steve Horsfield, and I serve as Executive Director with Simpson Housing Services. I'd like to pick up a little bit where Travis left off. Um, as a service provider, I'd like to convey to you the vital nature of, the, of these crisis response services that are funded by this proposed bill. This is the how and the where of engaging with Minnesotans experiencing homelessness and walking alongside on the pathway back to housing stability. 20 years ago when I started this work, when a person ran out of housing options, we really had one universal solution. It was a mat on a floor where you had to be in by 7 p.m. and out by 7 a.m. If you were an effective advocate for yourself, and exceptionally persistent, you might be fortunate to connect with housing programs. I'm very proud of the work that's been done in our communities over the past 10 years or so. We have drastically improved the quality and diversity of our crisis response systems. We have homeless to housing programs where unsheltered members of our community can connect with housing caseworkers and move directly into housing. Um, as Travis mentioned, we have culturally specific shelter. We have shelter for couples. We have shelter that caters to guests who have had long stints of unsheltered homelessness, of, of, out, of outdoor living, and overall a safer, more dignified set of solutions that more closely matches the diverse needs of our community. Much of these improvements have been funded by increased investments from our continuums of care, making good use of uh, increased housing program funds available in recent years. We have seen evidence of these improved outcomes in recent data published by Wilder Research. We do not want to go backwards on this vital work. Most everything in life starts with a safe place to call home. Ensuring that Minnesotans are stably housed is wise policy, supporting the most basic element of community infrastructure. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, and last, I have Rico Morales. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin. Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Rico Morales, and I am a lifelong Minnesota resident. I am here as a lived experience advisor and consultant for Hennepin County, and I'm also a person who was formerly homeless for 12 years. I was chronically addicted to drugs for most of my life, and I was in and out of shelters and homelessness pretty much all my life, ever since I was um, 20, 20 years old. I've been in Minneapolis since 1992, and the shelter system was something that I've experienced off and on throughout the years, decades actually, and I've seen the shelter system grow and change and adapt, and um, um, increase their f effectiveness for people with lived experience, for people who were formerly, for people who were looking for uh, housing supports. And this bill, SF, SF number 4018, is the Bridge to Shelter Act, and we need to continue this funding because we need to continue these programs that are working. The shelters, they work. The housing providers are doing the best they can with the money that they have. The nonprofits, the organizations. It's, it's um, this Bridge to Shelter bill and funding will continue the services that we have in Hennepin County, wraparound services with opioid addictions and recovering from other addictions. People 
looking for support, people looking for services, come to places like Homeward Bound or 1800 Chicago or uh, any other shelters. They come there and they look for help. And even the outreach workers, they, they go out to the encampments, and I see them all the time on Franklin Avenue in Minneapolis and different areas, um, picking up garbage and picking up needles and, and doing all this stuff. So this funding supports all of that work that we're doing here in Hennepin County, and I would like to see that continue. I owe my life to the shelters and the nonprofits because I was in and out and I was chronically addicted. I've been sober for more than 13 years through the support of permanent supportive housing. I was finally invited into housing after being chronically homeless for decades. And this, my life has changed. I am a person who can stand here and say that yes, I have benefited from the shelters and I have benefited from this programming and this funding, but there are so many other people that you only see on the streets or in, or in the tents or under sleeping bags or at the bus shelters that may never be able to come here this far and say, my life has been changed, but we are changing lives and we are reaching people through these programs, uh, outreach providers and navigators and the Hennepin County um, service providers, they're doing so much work at reaching people and helping people access services. This funding is crucial to saving lives and transferring people from unsheltered homelessness into emergency shelters and into permanent supportive housing, such as myself. I also am helping Hennepin County as the lived experience advisory group chair as one of the co-chairs, and I'm being able to add my voice and my experiences to Hennepin County and how we're going to administer funds or how we're going to address these problems with other needs that are unmet. So I've come almost full circle from homelessness, generational poverty, into uh, a place where I'm living right now, permanent supportive housing. I'm helping people. I'm helping my community. I'm helping Hennepin County. I feel so valuable. Now, I feel like a valued member of this productive society, and I am so happy to be here today. I just want to say thank you all for all your time, all your effort. Please put every effort you can into continuing this funding so that we can provide more, more services through the shelters, through Homeward Bound, through the street outreach workers, through the uh, administration of Narcan. I myself, I, I, uh, my, my roommate died. He died in, in December of, of, of an overdose, and I still carry some of that, the weight of that survivor's guilt where we need to do more. We need to do more and more and more every day, and I hope th that you can uh, have the same joy that I have, that waking up every morning and saying, I get to live another day sober and I get to help others. And this, that's, this funding and these programs are how I am able to live a better life today and for the rest of my life. So thank you so much, and thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much for, for sharing your, your story and your information with us today. Um, Members, it's um, clear that there's a need and that there, this bill has um, different ways that we can move forward. Do you have any questions or comments for Senator Muhammad? Senator Adkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, we, we realize the need that's out there, and as I look at the size of this bill, this would be a little hard on your checkbook. <laughs> but beyond that, I do have some questions. Um, Senator Muhammad, um, these continuums of care, how would that be defined? What would that include? Senator Muhammad, that is a really good question. Um, and I might phone a friend to help me out with that. I do have lots of providers with me yeah. who do this work, so I think it's better to, for them to answer it directly. Is there someone who can help help us with the definition and description of that term? Welcome to the committee. Um, if you could state your name and then did you hear the question? And Thank you, yes. Uh, my name is Danielle Werder 
and I support the homeless response system in Hennepin County. So continuum of care is a uh, functionality of HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, to allocate funding to the entire nation, trying to end homelessness in all of our different communities. And it looks different throughout the nation. Um, so here in uh, Minnesota, there are several different community of cares. And so what we're trying to do with this particular bill is use that structure to make sure that we're able to allocate funding equitably through a point in time count that's also part of that continuum of care functionality within HUD. So it's really trying to kind of build out what's already in place and not try to like add complexity, but still be able to support the systems and really look to local municipalities to guide those systems and build it out and look to local providers and people with lived experience. So it's HUD's way of making sure that local jurisdictions are able to help uh, build out programming. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Just to go a little bit further, um, actually that would have been kind of nice to have if it was in the bill language a little bit that would give us a little definition, but with HUDs, and I'm not familiar exactly with how that would fit here, is this from all single, I mean, does it include some single family structures or is it all multifamily or is it um, more of a group home setting? Can you give us just a little more of a definition? Absolutely. So the continuum of care actually is just talking about the homeless response systems within each municipality. So it's, it's everything. So for our continuum of care in Hennepin County, for example, we're talking about the full continuum of housing and emergency services. So through street outreach, drop-in centers, emergency shelter, all of our housing programs, uh, is all contained in that continuum of care. So it's really how people get served and move through that homeless response system. And so that it's not a bunch of different programs that aren't coordinated. There's The whole idea of the continuum of care is that it's a coordinated system so that people can get what they need and get served quickly. So it is everything, families, singles, people experiencing homeless, literal homelessness, essentially. Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just one uh, final comment. As I looked at um, the bill on the second page, it, of course, is five years of uh, this. So it's a $300 million ask. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the part that caught my eye was the, the ten up to a 10% administration fee. Um, to me, that's quite, it's an excessive amount. And I would hope that when these things do get ironed out or wherever it ends up at some point in the future, um, that that's, I mean, if we're spending a lot of money on homelessness, we want it to go to the end result and uh, um, affect the homeless rather than being burned up in the administrative side. So um, I would hope that could be reduced to a more acceptable or a reasonable amount. So, but, but thank you. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Senator Aki. I hear that. Um, I think we'll continue to work on that. I think currently, right now, um, with what we passed last session, it was also 10%. But I do agree that majority of that money should be going to the folks who need it. And so we'll continue to work with you on that. Thank you. Um, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just very briefly, thank you, Senator Muhammad, for bringing this bill. It's a good bill. Um, we know that shelter saves lives, and I just want to thank the testifiers who came here today and to tell your story. Thank you for doing that, um, uh, and and thank you uh, for bringing this bill. Uh, the, you know, three hundred million dollars is a, a a big price tag. That's a lot of money, uh, and especially you know, given the our current situation, not a budget year. Uh, but I think it's important to have these conversations and to really look at what the need is. That is what the need is to, to serve everyone who deserves it and who needs shelter, uh, who deserves that safe place to call home. And so um, I appreciate uh, you, know, you bringing the bill and us having this conversation because this is the work that is before us that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Mohammed, for yet another good bill from you. Um, I also want to echo Senator Bolden's comments to thank the testifiers um, for coming, especially you, Mr. Morales, for sharing your story. Um, not easy to come here and do that, and it, it's really meaningful, and I'm grateful to you. Um, your story is very inspirational. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what I think I heard from Commissioner Conley, that Hennepin County is spending $191 million a year. 
Is that correct, Senator Mohammed? That's correct. Senator Mohammed or, or Ms. Conley. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, um, Senator. Uh, yes, and that uh, just, this is very timely because we just approved another $9 million to go in. We are spending all that we have um, to fund um, the incredible increases that we're seeing in family shelter. So it is a $191 million spend, um, and that is up from a $146 million spend just about three years ago. So as you can see, our expenses uh, are continuing to rise, and we really need the help to keep meeting the need. Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Conley. Those are pretty stunning numbers, and obviously the need is great. Thank you for your work, and thank you again, Senator Mohammed. Um, members, any other questions? Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Mohammed. And thank you to the testifiers, for, again, for sharing their stories. I think that as we uh, start to dabble in or throw go in both feet full in uh, into end stage capitalism and we start to watch the decline of our society as companies gain more power and ruin our economy, that this problem will only get worse. Um, and so the sooner we can jump in and try to intervene, the better, obviously, because it will be cheaper, uh, but also because it will affect more people and change more lives. So uh, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, yeah. Um, any other uh, member questions or comments? Uh, Senator Mohammed, any, any final, final thoughts? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the testifiers as well for coming and telling their stories. I think that's um, incredible for them to be able to do that and for being vulnerable. Um, I think through the pandemic, we've been able to see this, um, the issue of unsheltered neighbor, uh, the unshelteredness of our neighbors in our faces. And I think people are struggling with it, whether it's like the counties or the cities or us state legislators, but our neighbors are struggling with it as well. I see it in my community. Um, I think obviously $300 million is a lot of money, but I know many places we spend money at the state level that I don't think that money should be going to, that I think it could be, it's more wise to use that money for folks who need it the most. And I think this is a critical, critical need. So I appreciate you for considering it. Thank you. And I really appreciate your bringing the bill forward. And thank you also to the testifiers. It really helps us understand um, the impact of the funding that that is going towards these programs, and I appreciate that um, all of these stakeholders are looking at such a comprehensive approach. It's statewide, and you know, um, hearing from Hennepin County what their experiences and what their plans are, um, we can see that um, comprehensive planning and implementation is really what helps us be successful. So thank you again for your bringing this forward, and Senate file. Uh, 4018 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, next, we have uh, Senate File 4779, Senator Marty. Welcome to the committee. And uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I uh, have Senate File 4779, and I do have a Technical amendment. I don't know if it's in the packets. If you want to deal with okay. it. Um, so Senator Marty has the A1 amendment. Um, Senator Kupek offers the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, the amendment is adopted. Thank you, Thank you, Madam Chair. And this fits in very well with the Hennepin County's thing because this is. The homeless problem is a statewide issue and the counties are working together. And um, Ramsey County, for instance, has less than a tenth of the state's population, but a third of its um, emergency shelter beds, a quarter of its emergency shelter beds. And the people filling those beds, only one third of them had prior Ramsey County addresses and others are people from all over. We're all in this together. And, um, and real quickly also to Senator Utke's thing, the, continuum of housing is meaning trying to prevent people from getting homeless and when they are homeless trying to get them support even when they're on the streets and then the next step may be sheltered support and then giving them supportive housing then working into affordable housing then working into rentals that market rate rentals and getting into home ownership all the continuum of housing and how we move people from homelessness to there 
But this bill, Senate File 4779, is a collaboration between over 100 different public, private, and nonprofit groups in Ramsey County. Last year, I think we had 60. Now we have 100 partnering groups. It's not the county doing this. It's the county doing this with all these other groups, and those groups are all participating in it. They're working to ensure homelessness in Ramsey County is rare and brief and non-recurring. And I think the collaborative approach they're doing here has been very essential to addressing the problems facing the community and the funding here, which would be needed to bridge from the post-COVID funding level until we get more sustainable housing and Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul have already invested, um, I think it's about $75 million in new affordable housing and they're working aggressively on that. This funding would be used to provide shelter and services to families, single adults, youth, and individuals who have challenging needs, help expand new and create new and enhanced adult overnight shelters, day shelters, and programs, infrastructure, and move people in the path to homelessness, including employment along the way. And I think there may be an article in your packets from St. Paul Pioneer Press about listening house hiring homeless to clean up the streets. It's a very powerful argument about how they're working on this. This investment is needed to bridge the gap we've had. We think, and these are huge numbers that are out there, but we understand that until we get people, one, to prevent and preserve the existing housing, we get new affordable housing for people in place, we have this gap. And the leadership of our local leaders has been remarkable in this case, and I have Ramsey County Commissioner Trista Martinson and Deputy Mayor for St. Paul, Jamie Tincher, here with me to speak to the bill. Thank you. Welcome to the committee and um, Commissioner Martinson and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Trista Martinson. I'm chair of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners. I'm also the chair of our Continuum of Care Heading Home Ramsey. We're one of 10 Continuum of Cares in the, as defined by HUD in the state of Minnesota. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to first say that we're very supportive of the Bridge to Shelter Bill, and we appreciate the committee's commitment to this work and effort to end homelessness in Minnesota. It really is a testament to your commitment um, with your investments that we saw last year and continuing this conversation this year. Um, Commissioner Conley mentioned that counties say it's going to take about five years to build housing, but and where we are that example in Ramsey County, we have made a very strategic five-year plan in partnership with our cities and our 100 uh, continuum of care providers, shelter providers, to say we need to go upstream and build housing. But in the meantime, just like we stabilize emergency rooms and triage, we need to stabilize our shelter system. For us in Ramsey County, that's about $15 million a year in order to just stabilize what we have currently to make sure we have enough shelter to bring people inside while we go upstream and build housing. We're working uh, simultaneously with the city and it is a strong commitment to make sure that we do this. Uh, this year's point in time count actually is revealing that we have a significant increase in uh, the need for additional shelter. We're seeing more and more each, uh, each year and we're really trying to work hard to go upstream stabilize the unsheltered population while we build housing. I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Mayor Tincher, who's gonna go into the details of what that looks like for us. Welcome to the committee, Deputy Mayor Tincher. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Wickland, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Tincher. I'm the Deputy Mayor in the City of St. Paul, and I serve as the Vice Chair, the elected Vice Chair of our Continuum of Care in, uh, Ramsey, in Ramsey County. I want to speak briefly about the role of the city as a partner in the work of Heading Home Ramsey, our continuum of care. And I'll point out, we've added a couple of handouts. We have some more information about the things that I'm going to speak to. Um, I included our homeless assistance response team's weekly update on the data that we have in St. Paul. And uh, thank you, Senator Martley, for mentioning the article about um, the listing house program that we've started. We in the city believe we are responsible for the work of connecting directly with our residents who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. With city resources, we've developed a comprehensive strategy and created specialized teams to support residents experiencing unsheltered homelessness to help them navigate the resources that are available. Our primary focus is solving for gaps in our systems for year, that for years have rotated people through homelessness, in and out of emergency rooms and jails, over and over and over. Ending unsheltered homelessness is achievable in St. Paul. 
I'll say that again, in our capital city, we can end unsheltered homelessness. It requires regular data analysis and continual coordination. With our partners in the continuum of care, we've gotten our arms around the dynamics of this problem. We know in real time how many people are outside, we know who they are, and we are making decisions based on that data. However, ending unsheltered homelessness will depend on continued dedicated financial investment in the system of supports for people while they are experiencing homelessness. We have had successes. In 2023, our homeless assistance response team moved 75 people from unsheltered homelessness to housing. The City of St. Paul and Ramsey County, as mentioned, invested $75 million into deeply affordable 30% AMI and below housing, and we went from adding only a couple of units at that price point a year to adding hundreds of units a year. We've launched St. Paul Work Now to provide employment opportunities to our neighbors experiencing housing instability, and we ask that you please support our request for the needed funding to maintain services for community stability like our day shelters, our emergency shelters, housing for families, single adults, and unaccompanied youth that are experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. And I also have a testifier listed, um, Lorene Randall Wade. Welcome, welcome to the committee, and if you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yes, ma'am. My name is Lorraine Randall Wade, and good morning, um, Chair Wicklin and members of the committee. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I am the Chief Executive Officer at an organization called Minnesota One Stop for Communities, where we provide housing and emergency shelter to single adults and families to bring them from homelessness to housing. I moved to Minnesota in 1998 with three small children who are all adults now with their own children. And when we arrived, we were homeless and we had to stay at a shelter and on couches until we found housing. It was organizations like the one that I am a part of today that opened their doors to bring in me and my children to help us find stable housing, to help me find employment, to help me now be a chief executive officer of an organization that lends hands to those that are in need. Your support to Heading Home Ramsey in the last couple of years has allowed my organization to provide emergency shelter to individuals and families who would have otherwise been unsheltered or in greater crisis. We started serving over 100 people a day and feeding them two meals and a snack seven days a week and providing them um, access to housing navigators to be stable um, and housed at the end of their shelter stay. Since then, the funding has been cut. We are now serving less than half of the ones that we were originally serving. And we understand that this is a policy year. I get that. It's not a budget year. However, without um, funding, those doors that are open will, not, will be closed as of summer. I am here to urge the support for Senate File 4779 so that our Ramsey County Collaborative can maintain what has been built over the last few years to provide folks to get back on track. Without your support and investment, more families and individuals are going to be back out on the streets, which will make the work to be even more heartbreaking to see individuals and families go without. I also want to take a minute to talk about how important the work that Heading Home Ramsey's Continuum of Care is doing. Since becoming a member of the steering committee, I have witnessed and tireless, the tireless efforts and continual support of community providers such as myself and so many others that benefit from the guidance and assistance and technical support that we receive from Heading Home Ramsey's Continuum of Care. Communities work better together when there is collaboration with leadership. 
Thank you so much for your time. Finally, I want to introduce our vice president of our youth advisory board, Shiloh. Uh, Welcome to the committee. And if you can state your name um, and then begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Shiloh Kilikai. I am the vice president of Heading Home Ramsey's Youth Advisory Board. Um, a little bit about me, I was also a homeless youth, um, roaming the streets, not knowing where my next meal would come from. Um, it hurts me seeing a lot of my peers, um, my age, just in a state of flux. You know, um, I've seen so many of them just give up, um, and that's not fair. Um, a lot of them that I've talked to personally have tried to access shelters and are unavailable. Um, a lot of them even have families uh, and are not forced and are forced to exit those shelters um, and just sleep on the streets. Um, since I became a member of the Youth Advisory Board, I have gained a broader perspective of what they go through on the day to day. And our mission on the Youth Advisory Board is to increase awareness for the youth homelessness and to advocate for them. Me and my board members, we engage in opportunities to advise the COC regarding youth homelessness. We have professional and develop and leader development skills. We engage in communities. We network and build those connections with partners and discover youth advocacy and policy pathways. Um, with this bill, I feel that the Youth Advisory Board will inform a broader collaborative work with the CLC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and sharing and, and the work you do. Uh, members, any questions or comments about the bill? Thank you. Senator Rocky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, yeah, I won't, this is very similar to the one we just heard, so the only comment I'll make there is, because um, this has the same language, I'd like, if these come back at some point, I'm hoping that that 10% is reduced down to a more bare bones amount, because hopefully if, at, when money is appropriated, that it's all getting to the purpose that it's appropriated for, rather than the administration, so. Um, that's all I have, so thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Commissioner, yes. do you have a response? Yes, Madam Chair and Senator, thank you for that. Uh, the reason for the 10% is that's probably uh, really bare bones. Many of our providers, like you just heard from our small community advisors working quickly with small staffs, we are very careful, especially with the administration of uh, tax dollars to nonprofits that we're providing the technical assistance, oversight, making sure that reporting is done properly. So that really is that technical assistance um, and the time required to do that. It is a, it's, we are very thorough on how we do the administration of funds. Sometimes the technical assistance also includes helping them uh, learn how to staff, apply for other grants and funding so that we can keep the stability of the organization. So it is a well used, uh, funds in order to support our providers. Senator Rutke, any, any, okay. Any other member questions or comments? I'm seeing none, any for final thoughts, Senator Just Marty? Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I think you realize how serious the problem is and I think that what uh, Hempen and Ramsey County have been doing here at, and some other places around the state as well, wonderful work to try and recognize one, to preserve the housing we have, and then two, as soon as people are displaced, finding them the help, whether they're still on the street, and then getting them moved into 
emergency shelters, which is not a great solution, but it's a part of the process, and we're trying to move it through the whole process, and I think it's been an excellent effort with the counties working with all these local groups, and again, it's, it's a lot of extra work to be engaging with people, but the people who are doing the work are the ones who really need to be tied together and consulted and worked with. So I'm, I'm really excited about this and hope the committee can help find some funds for it. So thank you for your time. Thank you, and I, I really appreciate your all of the testimony that was provided. Um, it is another um, proposal that seems like there's a very comprehensive approach and that you've got a lot of um, data and, and um, know what is successful and want to continue that, and there is just a huge need for this. So I appreciate your bringing it forward, and um, Senate File 4779, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. And next we will go to Senator Champion. Senate file 4807. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning mm -hmm. to the committee. Thank you for having us this morning. I know that you have a robust or, or a pretty big agenda, so I will be as brief as possible. And Madam Chair, um, the bill before you is Senate File 4807, and I thought I would put it in context and then have um, Dr. Moore uh, also talk a little about it. But according to the Minnesota Department of Health breastfeeding data, black or African-American breastfeeding rates dropped in 2021 to 76.4%. Infants and mothers who do, not, who do not breastfeed are at a higher risk for poor health outcomes, stronger uh, um, immune systems, and other things will be a natural, wonderful idea when we think in terms of breastfed children. You will hear from my presenter who's going to talk about some of the challenges, but also some of the wonderful things that happens. And, and, and this work is being done by the Chocolate Milk Club which is a 501c3 costly specific service of chosen vessel midwifery uh, services. And they were developed from, from community-based action research to address the low breastfeeding initiation and continuation rates of African-American women in Minneapolis. And with that, I'd like to introduce none other than Dr. LeVon Moore, uh, who is the CEO and founder of Chosen Vessels uh, Services. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Moore. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, um, committee and Madam Chair. I'm Dr. LaVon Moore. I'm a nurse midwife and lactation consultant in um, the city. Yeah, you got to stay for work. Okay. And um, I'm here to talk about the importance of breastfeeding. And as I listen to the various um, issues that um, and social determinants of health in terms of housing, transportation, and the things that you contend with, it makes this an important overlooked solution to many things that um, impact health care. As you know, black maternal health rates um, are in a crisis at this point. And I believe that breastfeeding is a, a simple solution. Um, that has been underutilized, or rather a tool that has been underutilized in addressing um, the maternal health crisis in our country right now. Um, when breastfeeding, um, one has access um, to um, microbiomes that impact one's immune system that keeps them healthy. It is not only important to the infant's health to prevent um, maternal death, as we know that African American infants die at a greater rate um, than non African American infants um, within that first year of life. And so, this is a tool to help prevent. Um, um, infant mortality as well as improve um, maternal mentality. The conditions that adversely affect African Americans at a greater weight in terms of obesity, hypertension, um, diabetes, and even SIDS and asthma can be greatly um, decreased by breastfeeding. Um, some of the issues that you face um, in bills around violence and um, um, financial um, issues that families are addressing can be impacted 
by breastfeeding. We know that breastfeeding children have secured bonds, and secured bonding with a child increases or improves their health. It eliminates the um, stress hormones that are released during um, delivery. It helps to mediate um, initial health challenges, and it protects their health going forward, not only of the infant, but also of the mother who's breastfeeding. So some of the things that are costing our health care system and our other systems, including our educational system, so many dollars um, can be impacted by breastfeeding. We know that breastfed children are more sociable, they're easier to parent, they're less aggressive, um, so therefore that leads to less violence. They also have greater... Um, um, they're smarter <laughs> than children who are not both sides of their brains are engaged through the process of breastfeeding. So they have a higher intellect um, and um, they are also um, less sick, which prevents um, parents from having to take less time off from work um, to uh, be at home. So it, it helps in terms of those dollars as well as the cost of health care dollars to pediatric visits and other health care dollars. So overall, for the many things that breastfeeding does, it is a cost-saving measure that we have not invested in, has not been um, as readily discussed in terms of resources to address health disparities. And so I come today um, to put um, this concept before you of the importance of breastfeeding. The Chocolate Milk Club um, was developed from community-based action research in Minneapolis to look at um, why the initiation and continuation rates of black women were so poor when it was such an important tool to address many of the issues that they were facing, health, economic, and otherwise. And so in doing so, we developed a program um, to um, address those needs based on what parents said that they wanted. And a majority of um, breastfeeding um, families were interested but were not educated or even introduced in the healthcare system during their pregnancy to breastfeeding that was assumed by healthcare providers that we did not want to breastfeed, and we found that that was not true. But because it's not a cultural norm, we don't have those um, um, models in front of us readily, we were not um, as exposed to the knowledge and benefits of breastfeeding when, in fact, we really do. So our goal is to combine um, in the work that we do, the midwife model of care in the cultural tradition of mutual aid to inspire all African American women to breastfeed and support all those that do. Because we know how much breastfeeding plays a uniquely important role in the health development and survival of African American infants. And, um, we are um, striving to restore this cultural practice in our community because it's so important. And last but certainly not uh, least, Senator Champion. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I think it's important to note, and you heard from Dr. Moore, who has been in this field for quite some time, breastfeeding has many short-term and long-term health benefits. However, it has evolved into more of a privilege than a right. We know that others are doing it because they understand, they have the exposure, it is a different expectation. But we believe that this initiative is really important. And so I know in my bill that <clears throat> there's no dollar amount there, uh, and I wanted to make sure that uh, we could put a dollar amount there. The request, Madam Chair, is $250,000. Uh, and uh, my a testifier can talk about how that $250,000 would be used. Um, obviously, we know that revenue is tight, and, and we can certainly you know, talk about if there's some uh, decreased amount, but we think it's important for uh, this initiative to go forward and to continue to expose the community to this important notion of breastfeeding because we know that there are better outcomes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and we'll stand for any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Abler. <clears throat> well, thanks. And, um, you know, we had six kids, and uh, that's, you know, my family has thought that's a great idea to breastfeed and all that. I wonder if Senator Morrison could just ask a, answer a question for me. Um, you can hear the question first, decide if you want to answer it. But, I, um, you know, there's, there's been trends over the past with uh, formula companies, you know, saying this is just as good and, and the convenience and all. Um, what is the current state of recommendations with the obstetric 
um, world about continuing breastfeeding and encouraging that uh, over formula? It's not meant to be a trick question. I'm just curious what the consensus is these days. Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Abler, and thank you, Senator Champion, and thank you also very much for your testimony and your work. Uh, the, you know, it's sort of out of the obstetric care realm, although um, obstetricians have a role in educating their patients, particularly in the postpartum and preconceptual period, but the American Academy of Pediatrics rec recommends a year of, of breastfeeding for all uh, new mothers. Um, you know, this is an incredibly important issue. You know, the, the black maternal and infant health crisis is an American tragedy and an American problem that every single American should be concerned about. And I completely agree with you that this is a piece of, of solving that, uh, that crisis. Um, so if that answers your question, yeah. Senator Abler. No, it, it's helpful. Senator and, Abler. You know, the, I just remember the Nestle company and others were just, uh, even in developing countries, we're trying to get formula going. And, um, you know, I, I, go ahead. Senator Morrison. M Madam Chair, I just wanted to add one thing because I didn't complete uh, your question. Uh, there's clear scientific evidence that breast milk uh, is superior to infant formula. Yeah. Senator Ebler. Yeah, I just remember just in the back of my mind as we were, like the LHA League was out there encouraging this. and. Um, you know, um, I, I, it's, I think it's really important. I was just, and so, how do we make this, you know, culturally competent to help every group have it? And, it, and I just wonder. I mean, as you try to address the issue, um, you know, is, are the pediatricians uh, not encouraging this enough? Is there a lack of pediatric care for different, you know, communities? And so, I support your work. I'm just trying to pile on a little bit in a way to help. So uh, hope you can get, and thanks for what you're doing. So, and if you want to react, you can, but thank you. Madam. Thank you, Madam Dr. Chair, um, Senator. Um, I'd like to speak to your question, and I think that what I have found is that um, there has not been enough education or support um, for this population in breastfeeding. And there is an assumption that is made that if you're a doctor or a nurse that you are um, um, informed on breastfeeding medicine. And breastfeeding medicine is a specialty within itself and there is a lot of misinformation within our community. So we found that uh, it's just not about educating um, those who are preparing um, to um, have children or are also um, breastfeeding, but it's also about educating other providers in our community as well, so that misinformation, old information is not continuing to be um, um, spread around breastfeeding. There's a lot of new um, research has been done on the benefits of breastfeeding. There is nothing that compares to um, one's own breast milk. There's no formula that can be concocted. Um, and the outcomes that breastfeeding does, there is really no better medicine, and that's why it's considered medicine, than breastfeeding um, and the benefits. And I, I do appreciate um, Senator Champion bringing this forward in his comments about access, because it also is about access to um, lactation consultants um, and other educators and counselors. And usually what happens is for um, many women of color, they do not have the resources to have access to those um, professionals. And so we have worked um, to make sure that they have access to those professionals, to education, to support, to them in their families, into the community at large to um, normalize breastfeeding um, within this community. Thank you. Any other member questions or comments? Senator Mann. She's a Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I will also add that we as a society make it really difficult to breastfeed, right? We make no accommodations in the workplace. We don't have areas to breastfeed. We shame women for breastfeeding yes. in public because uh, mm -hmm. our bodies have become so sexualized, especially the bodies of women of color. Um, and then we, <clears throat> we have people giving birth, and then we tell them to get back to work in two weeks. And then we tell them how important breastfeeding is, right? Which is why paid family leave is so critically important. Um, and, um, and like Dr. Moore mentioned, the access to health care. 
I think every conversation we have at the end of the day comes down to access to health care, which in America is a gigantic problem. So thank you for your work, and thank you, Senator Champion, for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Senator Champion, any final thoughts that you'd like to share? You know, uh, Madam Chair Committee, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for listening. I know that you hear all things health care in this committee. Uh, thank you for your understanding and sensitivity. Um, we believe that this is an important initiative for you to consider uh, resourcing because we believe it's important not just to educate but to also have credible voices that various people in the community will listen to. And, uh, uh, and where there's that notion of trust, people are much more engaged and we know black maternal health is something that's in crisis as uh, Senator Morrison said. Uh, and so we just hope that, that that understanding this will be reflective in your decisions as to what you can do with the very limited resources that you have. So thank you so very much. And thank you, Madam Chair, for having the vision and thoughtfulness to hear this bill. Thank you. And I apologize. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have a couple questions for Senator Champion. First of all, um, in the bill, it has the commissioner working with uh, a grant to the Chosen Vessels Midwifery Services, which is an LLC, but then you've mentioned a nonprofit. Can you explain a little bit about how this, how they work together and how that, you know, the, the process of the flow down to the end provider, which would be um, the nonprofit, which I believe is Chocolate Milk Club? Uh, so, uh, Senator Champion. So I'll start and then I'll have uh, my testifier finish off. We always think it's important to make sure that there's a contract between uh, the uh, direct service provider um, as well as with, uh, with our Commission of Health because there will be that contract to determine um, outcomes and, 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 and all the parameters of a contract. Now, uh, a chosen uh, vessel is a 501c3 is my understanding, which is a nonprofit, uh, and so so she can talk a little about the structure of her organization and how that flows down to cho chosen vessels midwifery. Chosen, um, Doctor Moore. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, chosen vessels midwifery. Chocolate Milk Club actually um, was developed out of Chosen Vessels Midwifery Services. Um, Chosen Vessels Midwifery Services did community-based action research to develop a prob um, develop a solution to um, black maternal health, and from that, developed the Chocolate Milk Club, which was um, it has evolved um, in um, its practice and scope of work, and evolved basically into its own entity, and that is why it is um, a nonprofit entity or portion of Chosen Vessels, very much like um, some of the other organizations that you've seen or heard about in the past, like North Point um, Health and Human Services also has an ink side and a, a, a medical side. So it's kind of a spinoff as the work grew and evolved and the need grew and evolved. Um, Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and one less, last thing, and it's more just a comment about the way the bill is written. Um, you know, the title of it, it's Education and Support of, on Breastfeeding. But then I go into the, the middle of the bill, um, starting in the middle of line 1.11. We've got two sentences which happen to be more, I, I don't think that's the type of language and stuff that we put in statute. And I had, a, I just wondered if that's, you know, we should, if that should be removed, you, you, the top portion of the bill and then the following couple sentences, I think, do what you're wanting it to do. But those two sentences, to me, are more like what we read in the newspaper. Madam Chair. Senator Champion. Senator Uckey, um, again, uh, I, I, it is my understanding that this bill is going to be laid over for possible inclusion. And, of course, the committee has the, uh, the right to take portions of it that they believe uh, captures what it is that we're doing. What's most important to us is that the work is done and the work is resourced. So um, with that being said, we are open for what that language should look like and, and how it should be reflected in your bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Senator Champion. And that's why I mentioned it here, because 
if, if it was to be changed or could be changed as it moves forward, uh, that's the time to do it. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Atkey. Yeah, we can, we can definitely take a look at that. I guess the last thing I'd like to do before uh, we move on is, is just it, since you put forward the, the dollar amount, if we could make an oral amendment to add that to the bill. And if Senator Mann could move that um, on 1.8 and Council, you can give me the exact language, but we could add the um, 250,000 instead of the blank. Um, Ms. Hoffman, would you, would, would you state the amendment that we need for that? Certainly, Madam Chair. Uh, the amendment would be page one, line eight, delete everything before is, and insert $250,000. Thank you. Um, on Senator Mann's oral amendment, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The amendment, oral amendment is adopted. Thank you, and thank you again for your testimony and for coming before the committee. And um, Senate File 4807, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. And next we have Senator Dibble. Welcome to the committee, Senator Dibble, and please go ahead. I don't see that you have any amendments, so um, please go ahead and present your bill. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair and members, for the opportunity to present Senate file number 5032. I'd also like to take the opportunity, Madam Chair, to thank my co-authors, uh, Senator Mann, uh, Senator Mitchell, and Senator Pa. Uh, Madam Chair and members, this, is, uh, this bill before you is an initiative to gain more information about the number and the circumstances of youth, of young people who are experiencing homelessness and who are also pregnant or parenting. Uh, Madam Chair, we already know from data gathered and maintained by the Wilder Foundation that Minnesota on any given night, about 4,500 to 5,000 young people are without appropriate housing. These are young people who are disconnected from their families and their communities. And about 13,000 to 13,500 young people have this experience every year in Minnesota. We're gaining ground, and of course, I'm very proud of the fact that we tripled our support uh, for these young people um, in the budget that, that you advanced and supported last year, Madam Chair. That was uh, a game changer, a phenomenal achievement, um, and very proud of the work that the agencies that serve these young people do. They save lives and transform lives, um, and it's extremely important. But a number of these agencies um, are seeing uh, many, many of these young people who are pregnant and parenting, and they need more information. Um, you know, a lot of the funds that come through the Homeless Youth Act recognize a full continuum of services, but there are some special needs um, that we really need to understand and best practices for young people who are, who are parenting, who have young children themselves, or are pregnant. The overarching goal, of course, is to ensure that homelessness uh, can be avoided, and when it does happen, it is of short duration and doesn't reoccur. And of course, if we are successful in finding the information and then developing and delivering the services to this particular cohort, we will get far ahead of the game. We will have healthier young people, healthier babies, healthier pregnancies, less likelihood of adult homelessness, more likelihood of young people growing up and thriving as well as their children. Um, you'll see in your packet a number of letters of support that articulate the need and, and uh, artic articulate the need to serve this, these young people um, and articulate the need to really know more and to gather more data. So it's a modest sum, about $150,000. Uh, we would ask the state to contract with the Wilder Foundation to undertake this analysis. So with that, we have a couple of people here who would like to also share some of their perspective on why this bill is such a great idea. So who's going to start? I'm welcome, Catherine Mears. Uh, welcome to the committee, and whoever, yes, who wants to go first, um, Ms. Mears, great. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Chair Wickland and members of the committee, and thank you so much, Senator Dibble, for your leadership on homelessness. My name is Catherine Mears, and I am the Executive Director of Avenues for Youth. I'm also the co-chair of the Policy Committee for the Youth Services Network. The Youth Services Network is a statewide collaborative of organizations that support youth experiencing homelessness. Avenues, along with some of our YSN partners, including The Link, Lutheran Social Services, and The Bridge for Youth, 
provide emergency shelter and housing programs specifically for young families experiencing homelessness. Unfortunately, there are far too many youth experiencing homelessness while they are pregnant and parenting. Being a parent is a challenge. Being a young parent is even more challenging. Being a young parent while experiencing homelessness is beyond challenging. It is heartbreaking to see what we see every day. Pregnant and parenting youth with children doing their best to survive while living out of cars, couch hopping, and worse. Youth who are pregnant and parenting have unique needs and challenges while experiencing homelessness due to their age. They really need and deserve programming that best supports them and their children's needs. They are also at high risk for having their children removed from them by child protection due to not being able to provide safe housing. This is extremely traumatizing for them and their children. Providing shelter and housing for these youth and their children can help to keep their young families together while supporting both the young parents and their children. We are so grateful for the historic investments that you all made in youth and all homelessness last session, and we know our work is not done. This study will help us further develop and strengthen our statewide response for pregnant and parenting homeless youth and their children. It will provide more concrete numbers for us, help determine what the best methods are for supporting and pregnant and parenting youth and providing shelter and housing for young families. And it will identify gaps in services. It will help us to plan and develop our capacity to serve young families. The families we support are amazing and deserve all of the support they can have. We are asking you to support Senate File 5032. Thank you so very much. Thank you, and welcome to the committee. And Ms. Exum, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hello, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lily. I use all pronouns, and I am a past program participant in the Lynx Young Families Program. I have an eight-year-old son, and when my wife was pregnant, we were newly sober and dealing with homelessness at the time. We were not able to find shelter or housing together. Eventually, there was some hoops that we were able to jump through with the link, and um, we were able to get permanent housing. There were so many barriers for resources due to our age, marriage status, and sexual orientation and gender identity. There were so many young families and parents out there trying to raise and care for their children when they, they aren't even adults themselves. It is important to support this bill and give more funding for research on pregnant and parenting youth experiencing homelessness. The difference a little support can do for someone can change the whole outcome for generations. Stable housing for young people helps build the foundation for consistency in a household that allows young people to thrive and participate in society in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your, your story and support. Uh, members, any questions? Um, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Debel, for bringing this um, important uh, concept forward. This is a uniquely vulnerable group um, with significant long-term consequences for individuals, families, and society. Um, and Lili, thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate your sharing your story. Um, I'm just wondering, Senator Dibble, is there is this is the appropriation for scoping of the bill, or does Wilder have a plan for how they're going to perform this study? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe the latter is the case, um, that uh, we're not in for a penny, then in for a pound. I think the $150,000 um, would allow Wilder to really dive in and, and try to do some of the data gathering and some of the analysis and deliver some of the uh, information. But I'll uh, stand to be corrected by Catherine Mears if I'm incorrect, but that's my understanding. Madam Chair, Senator, that is in fact correct. Um, we have spoken with Wilder and uh, they have plans for uh, involving youth with lived experience in the study and this will in fact uh, pay for the complete study. Uh, thank you. Senator Morrison, anything else? Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions or comments? Um, Senator Kupak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Dibble, too, for this bill. Um, my fear is that, that probably we're going to find some numbers here um, that are going to be staggering uh, when we do this because chronically uh, I think youth are 
undercounted a lot of times in the homeless situation, and then particularly this, just because the couch surfing and all sometimes is just not included or, or thought of as being homeless, but certainly it is, and it is it is a, still a huge problem ongoing. So um, I'm, I'm glad we're going to do the research because that's how we figure out you know uh, where we should allot money in the future. So thanks, Senator Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, um, and uh, thank you for that comment, uh, Senator Kupek. Um, that, and it's, it's very insightful. That has always been the case um, because, of course, we know that homeless youth don't, we don't see them necessarily um, in the community. Um, some, they're indoors much of the time, but indoors in very, very unstable and inappropriate settings. Um, I mean, sometimes we do see them. They're, you know, unhoused and, and you know, out in, in the, you know, in the outdoors, but um, that's often the case, um, and some of the uh, criteria that are used um, by officialdom um, don't even recognize uh, homeless youth experiencing homelessness because as inappropriate as the setting is, you know, they're trying to squeeze people out of their criteria to reduce the, the level of resources that they need. And so that's, that's been the whole idea around the Homeless Youth Act is got to find these young people and get them into much, much better settings connected to adults who love them and care for them. Um, but the other uh, thought that was triggered by your comment is we always have to emphasize that this is not a metro issue. You, of course, represent Moorhead. Um, and uh, this is a statewide issue. The scale and scope of the study will be a statewide basis um, because we know that uh, homeless youth show up in every community in every corner of the state. Thank you. Um, any other member questions or comments? Um, I guess I just add that it does seem like a really um, helpful and vital um, report that we could gain a lot of you know access to important information about how we're serving um, youth and um, and maybe the things that we don't know you know that we could be doing a lot better so I uh, appreciate re your bringing the bill forward any final thoughts for the committee no I just uh, madam chair I just want to say that uh, it's, it's not as if these this cohort is not being served um, uh, Ms. Mears's, um agency we have Beth Holger in the back um, we know Lisa Mears with the bridge um, they all have you know specialized programs that serve and then they're and they're amazing you know these young people coming together, living in kind of a communal setting, um, forming community, supporting each other, or finding independent housing. Um, but we need just a lot more information about best practices, also the scale and scope of, of the issue. Um, I, as folks may know, I'm involved in the textile arts, knitting and the others, and uh, every year we do a big drive um, to do blankets and hats, and, and we, some, in some years, we produce literally hundreds, and they take all of them and use all of them. That just gives you a sense of the, the scale and scope of the problem. Well, thank you for, for bringing it forward. Um, thank you to the testifiers. And um, Senate File 5032 will be laid over for possible inclusion in an om omnibus bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And members, uh, we have come to the end of our agenda, and this um, hearing is adjourned.